everyone, and welcome to episode 157 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sapolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. These days, when people depict medieval warfare, they tend to do it in two ways. People bashing each other with big swords and no plan, or people upholding chivalry, which is shown to be a strict code which left no room for dishonest or dishonorable conduct. In the real Middle Ages, warfare meant tactics and strategy, and a hefty dose of trickery. After all, as they say, all's fair in love and war. This week, I spoke with Dr. James Titterton about his new book, Deception in Medieval Warfare, Trickery and Cunning in the Central Middle Ages. James's work focuses on the use of deception as a well-attested strategy of warfare and its place in medieval culture. Our conversation on the tricks warriors kept up their sleeves, the use of spin by chroniclers, and the morality of using deceit against the enemy is coming up right after this. You've probably heard of the publisher Boydell and Brewer, friends of this podcast who often participate in Medievalist.net's book club on Patreon. This week, our friends at Boydell want to let you know about their award-winning new paperback, Stone Fidelity, Marriage and Emotion in Medieval Tomb Sculpture, by Jessica Barker. This is the first book to examine the medieval double tomb, depicting husbands and wives holding hands in effigy, such as those found in Westminster Abbey and Canterbury Cathedral. In its look at medieval marriage, Barker's book reveals the careful artifice beneath the seductive emotional surface, the artistic, religious, political, and legal agendas that underlie the medieval rhetoric of married love. Winner of the Historians of British Art Book Award for Exemplary Scholarship on the period before 1600, Stone Fidelity is now available in hardcover, paperback, and ebook at boydellandbrewer.com. Well, thank you, James, for coming on to talk about deception. It is great to meet you. No, thank you very much for inviting me. So let's start at the beginning. I mean, I think that your book has conclusively come to the idea that this is all very cut and dried, right? Deception, everyone just thinks of it exactly the same way throughout history, right? Not quite. (laughs) So how do we find out what people thought about deception and warfare? Where do you look for that information? My focus has been to look at the narrative sources for medieval warfare. So mostly the chronicle histories that are being written at the time and describing warfare, which are very, I think the word would be problematic, maybe, as a source for warfare. Because although these are histories, they are nothing like we would consider to be objective reporting today. They are written very rarely by eyewitnesses, and even then you then have all the problems of eyewitness testimony. They're mainly being written on secondhand information by people who are not active combatants themselves. And they are also filtering it through all sorts of layers of cultural expectations, previous models, what they expect history to look like, and a worldview that interprets the world in different ways that we would. For for example, when they look at military matters, a lot of the medieval Christian authors will interpret it as uh, divine intervention as the reason for victory in a battle, for example, rather than modern military stories look at things like strategy, tactics, logistics, things like that. We can sometimes find those interpretations mixed in there, but you always have to be aware that they are looking at it from a very different point of view to us and how we would expect it. But they are really our only or our major sources for the conduct of medieval warfare. And I've tried to mix in, in the book, some of the more literary sources, things like romances and French epics, the Chanson de Chest, but they have their own problems of interpretation because they are deliberately serving the purpose of entertainment. This is your blockbuster entertainment. This is your sort of fantasy of what warfare is like. Whereas the chronicles we're looking here are looking more at what we think of as history. Mm -hmm. When I look at chronicles, there's always that idea that numbers are exaggerated or things like that. And Mm. I had always thought about their referring back to previous books that they've read as being kind of a shorthand. It Mm. makes it so that they can just drop something in and everyone will know what they're talking about. But it wasn't until reading your book that I thought of the additional thing, which you mentioned, that they're also showing off how well read they are in military yeah. treaties. <laughs> yeah, so no, then... absolutely. Yeah. Not only that, is that they learn their Latin, because these are almost all written in 
in Latin, of course. They learn their Latin by reading the greats. They read the Bible, but they also read Cicero, the Cicero, they also read Lucan, they read Caesar, and Vegetius and Frontinus. And so when they are trying to describe something, the best phrasing that they know is from there. So they'll often lift it wholesale and stick it in because that's just how they think of it as an elegant Latin phrase. Mm-hmm. And they may not even be conscious of it. We speak, you know, ordinary language is full of cliches. We talk in cliches all the time. And we may borrow a movie quote or a quote from a <laughs> novel or something to describe something because it's the best way or it's just how we ended up thinking about it. And this is the same in the Latin. So you will get, for my book, for example, there's a phrase from the Aeneid, Virgil, which is trickery or deception, who cares which when it comes to an enemy or in the case of an enemy. And that crops up over and over again. Sometimes not in that exact phrase, but definitely that idea keeps coming up and up again. And it's them trying, I think, it's these authors trying to encapsulate a mindset and um, worldview in this pithy phrase. They love pithy phrases. That's why you have, like, Valerius Maximus gets copied all the time, and his work is just a bunch of pithy phrases you can put into your work to show how erudite you are and how well read. (laughs) <laughs> That's the thing. I always thought it was, you know, people forgetting the cliches that they've read, but it's still, as you say, it's still in our culture where sometimes people are trying to signal to you that they've seen the Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So let's dig into some examples of deception. So you've organized this in a bunch of different sections and we may get to them all and we may not, but let's start with something that's really exciting and fun, I think. And that is spies. Now yeah. trying to find, <laughs> spies are always good, right? Trying to find spies in Chronicles though, has some challenges. What's the big challenge of finding spies? Well, a good spy is hidden. The best spy is one you don't know exists. Mm -hmm. The whole point is to gather information from your enemy without knowing you're doing it. It's John Presswich, I think, has a really good article about intelligence gathering for the Norman kings, particularly William the Conqueror. And he makes a very good point that when it says in a chronicle, it was reported to the king that this was happening or that was happening. What he is actually referring to here is this whole network that the king would have had of intelligence, which is coming from what we think of as spies, uh, people who are being paid to secretly gather information, but also agents who are just gathering information elsewhere. They're gathering information from travellers, from local monasteries, local officials. Merchants are a really good way of getting information. A lot of evidence we have for people actually Paying these agents comes from later than the period I'm studying, which is a documentary survival thing. And they're really fascinating. You know, you have Swiss cities recording that we paid such and such a person to deliver such and such information. And it's like, ah, oh, why can't I get this for Henry II or, <laughs> or you know, Simon de Montfort? I'm sure we're doing exactly the same thing, but we just don't have quite the evidence. And the other problem we've got is that the word that we would translate as spy can mean scout. Mm-hmm. The word, which is where we get the word explorer from in English, explorator, it often will say in a chronicle, and they sent out exploratores, or these explorers came back and told them things. We're never entirely sure if these scouts are people that have just been sent out on fast horses to go and look over the next hill or something. Or sometimes it's implied that they're going about this in a clandestine way, in a sneaky way. They're using disguise or deception and they're going out and they're coming back. Or they may even be traitors from the enemy camp, people that they've paid to go and and, and bring them information. A touchstone text that I use when discussing this is the story of Joshua sending men into the promised land and Jericho. And when they are discovered in Jericho, staying with Rahab, the men of Jericho go to the king and say, we have found exploratores from the Israelites. What do you want to do about it? What should we do? And again, are these spies? They're going in secret, but they're also scouting. It's really ambiguous. So it's difficult to identify sometimes what they actually are, whether they're using deception to get there or if it's more just standard scouting. Yeah, I think you mentioned in the book that it's much easier in relative terms to see spies or exploratories when you're looking at crusade sources, because it's not people who are speaking the same native language anymore. They're people who have to have special skills. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have a really nice one that comes from Richard the Lionheart when he's on the third crusade. It actually talks about someone called 
Bernard, the king's explorator, and this is clearly a spy. And it says Bernard was a man born in Syria, and they send him off into Egypt in Saracen clothes. And he can speak Saracen language, it says. This is the phrase of so probably Arabic. And they send him off to go and find the caravans they want to attack to go and plunder. So it's implied that while they are in Palestine, while they are in the Holy Land, they don't speak the language because normally you could just sort of grab a nearby peasant and say, you know, peasant, where's the road? Where are they <laughs> going to come through? And whereas in Syria, you have to find people who can speak the language who can pass unnoticed because it's really obvious when a bunch of Frenchmen come riding past. <laughs> You have this need, it seems, to have people who can speak the language, particularly if you're new, you're newly arrived or you've not been there very long. Robert Giscard, the Norman warlord, has a lovely uh, little story that we have about him sending a deacon as his ambassador. He sends deacon Peter to Palermo in 1068. And it says that this Peter the deacon can speak the language of the Saracens, so we're assuming Arabic. And so he goes there, but he pretends he can't speak it. He pretends he can only speak Greek. And so the Saracens talk in front of him as if he can't understand. He comes back to Robert Giscard and says, this city is like a man without a soul. The morale is completely shot. You can attack at any time and they'll surrender. It's this really nice sort of, it's this spying and diplomacy and espionage it's all these things of uh, a layer upon layer and it's it's very much also about the culture that they're operating in that robert is operating in. he has these polymath people he can talk to these people with um, various languages and he can send them out and use them <laughs> yes and i like that example so your book is laid out in different chapters that talk about different things but i feel like the espionage thing is intertwined with disguise as the chapters are porous as all things oh, yeah, when you're yeah. talking about deception are but i think it's interesting that you have a spy in this case that is already ordained and that's fine but when people disguise themselves as clergy this is not considered as cool in many of the sources like you can disguise yourself as something else but disguising yourself as a holy person that is a low trick yeah i mean order vitalis really doesn't like it when that happens you know, order <laughs> vitalis is a, a norman monk and he has this description of louis the fat attacking a norman town a town called Gazni on the border between the duchy of normandy and french domain and he says that he and his men enter Gazni disguised as monks in black cloaks with hoods up, very Errol Flynn's Robin Hood. And <laughs> yeah. then they get, they get inside and then they need to throw off the cloaks and, and take it. What's really interesting about that one is that we have the same incident recorded in the French Chronicle, which is very, very positive about Louis. It's, it's called The Deeds of Louis the Fat, although that wasn't the original title. I don't think he'd have been very happy. Um, <laughs> uh, Suger of Saint-Denis. And Suger of Saint-Denis says, yes, they went in in disguise, but they're dressed as travellers. Mm -hmm. And so it's not quite that sense of blasphemy because Audric makes this big thing and there's a monastery there and that they turf out the monks and they turn this out of God into a den of thieves. So it's all this biblical resonance going on here. Whereas Suger is much more about Louis's heroic behaviour in this circumstance, because he sends off an advance guard and they get caught by the garrison and the garrison are attacking them. So Louis has to come charging down the hill on his horse and save them. So it's the same incident that appears to be historically accurate, appears to have happened, but the completely different spin you can give it depending <laughs> on whether you're a Norman or a Frenchman. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the conclusions you drew from this was that you can have clergy going back and forth and they're almost neutral parties, sort of, mm. mainly, and you can't abuse that. That's not very nice. But at the same time, other people say, well, it's pretty wise to do that because why wouldn't you? Yeah, <laughs> all, is, yeah. all is fair, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You have Gerald of Wales' story about when Henry II is fighting one of the Welsh kings in, in around Snowdonia, and he sends this local deacon, this Welsh deacon, says, oh, it's deacons again. I think there's something about you about deacons, maybe. <laughs> They're cheaper, uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> it takes a lot to bribe an archbishop. You know? um, <laughs> he sends this deacon off with a Breton knight, and it says he led him through all of the most desolate parts of the country side and he's eating grass and he says what are you doing he says oh wait this is all we can get to eat around here it's terrible and, and they go through briars and bogs and things that so the breton knight comes back to the king and says no way we can take this place no way we can attack something to eat it's going to be hell you might as well just negotiate with him and this is 
kind of interesting because Gerald is really on the side of the deacon here. He seems to think this is hilarious. Like, look at this stupid Frenchman who we managed to trick. But yeah, it seems to be that kind of like he's got local knowledge because the clergy seems to be based in a, a local area and they have local knowledge. So they're a useful source that way. But there's also this potential that they have other political allegiances because, of course, they are deeply involved or likely to be deeply involved in local politics, national politics. So there's examples of clergy becoming involved and being criticised for it, but they can also be useful. To Gerald, it's valiant. If we had a source that was from that Breton Knight's perspective, that he would describe him as a perfidious Welshman, a barbarian, an <laughs> oathbreaker, a traitor. Mm -hmm. But because it's a funny story that makes the Welsh look good, and Gerald of Wales is sympathetic to the Welsh, it's translated as comedy rather than tragedy. Yeah, well, there's one other place where I think this whole spin based on religious and sacred things really comes out. And that's when people pretend to be bringing in a body for funeral. There's a few times that happens and it really depends on who the spin is. And I think one of them, they said, oh yeah, we pretended that this guy needed to be buried, but we stopped before the gates of the monastery. Yeah. That would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, this is, a, this is a really fascinating story that first appears in a very early chronicle, 11th century chronicle of history of the Normans. And it's this sort of pseudo mythical story about Hasting, this who was a real person, but in this case, he's kind of cast as this anti-heroic ancestor of the Viking, the Norman people, he's this Viking who attempts to sack Rome, he attacks the wrong city because <laughs> it does. He mistakes one of the cities for Rome and he pretends to be dying. So the Christians come out of the city and they baptize him. And then the next day he pretends to be dead. And his men come in and say, we have to bury him, he's dead. He's now a Christian, we have to bury him in the monastery. And then the, the author, Dudo of San Quentin, has this incredibly long description of the, him being brought in to be buried and during the funeral mass the body jumps up and <laughs> kills the bishop saying the mass and they sack the city and oh it's terrible it's terrible but this story keeps being repeated so it's obviously a story that people like telling they think it's funny i mean you were laughing just then as i told the story mm -hmm. in, in the summary so surprise <laughs> yeah surprise. it's just the funny story so it appears again in robert geetsgaard's story william of apulia who's writing a, a history of robert geetsgaard's life tells the story again but in this version it's not Robert that does it he pretends one of his own men is dead and as you say they don't actually do any sacrilege they say we need to bring the body in and they get to the door and then they drop the body across the door the beer so they can't get in and then the Normans all run in and take it down so there's no like murdered bishops and monks <laughs> being sort of horrendously churches being desecrated and things mm -hmm. and then this story then again appears in a Norse saga the story of Harold Hardrada who's you know famously involved in 1066 and all that but that again it's in this norse saga the morskin skin i apologize i'm not a norse scholar so that's probably a <laughs> terrible pronunciation where it's taken and used for hardrada attacking a muslim city in sicily which i think is a bit dodgy i think that this isn't coming from hardrada originally i think it's coming from dudo and being ascribed to hardrada because why would a Muslim garrison let a Christian burial party in? It doesn't seem to make much logical sense. As much as any of these stories make any sense, <laughs> this story makes logical sense to begin with. It is, it is fan really fantastical and sort of outrageous and pulpy. But yeah, they give it to Hardrada, but again, they take out blasphemy. So I think that this story is circulating in Northern Europe around this time, in the, around the 11th, 12th century, and people like the story. It also appears in a, in a chanson de geste around this time. Again, it's in Italy, I think, it's Roland. It's like a prequel to the chanson de Roland. Roland and the paladins use this to get into a city to pretend a guy's dead. So they like the story, so they take away the negative aspect that we tell it, so that you leave the admirable, the trickery, the cunning, the funny bit, and we don't have any of the villainy that Asting is associated with. So this is a, a nice example of how these stories evolve and they get changed as they appear in different sources. Yeah, and they have to make the person look good. And so you have to have that spin of morality or at least smarts on it, which mm. brings me to one of the chapters that you have is on feigned flight. And of course, the most famous example you have in there is the Battle of Hastings. And this is being spun in several different ways so that whenever someone is running away, it's on purpose. <laughs> They're yeah. not cowards. And that no. is a really tricky thing because that is something that obviously you can spin afterwards. Whether you were there or not, you can say, oh, yeah. no, this was just false. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah, different accounts of the Battle of Hastings. So you have Carmen de Hastings, which is a song of the Battle of Hastings, which is written very shortly afterwards. The song says, oh, this was entirely a trick, that the English are stuck up, are up on Zenlight Hill and the Normans couldn't penetrate the battle lines. So they, they used cunning, they used a skill at war and pretended to run away as if defeated. But then if you go to William of Poitiers, William the Bastard's chaplain, in his version, the left flank of the Normans, which is not Norman, the Norman army is made up of like Bretons and things, and William of Poitiers really wants you to know it's not Normans who started running away, it's Bretons, <laughs> cowardly Bretons. And then he is able to portray the famous scene that we see in the Bayer Tapestry of the Duke riding forward and taking off his helmet and saying, look, I'm not dead. And then they do the faint flight. Then they try and do it again because it works. It threw them off the hill. We don't know. We can't possibly know. None of these are the definitive account of the battle. It's just different versions, of different spins on, on the events. Sometimes it's portrayed as cunning. Sometimes it's portrayed as a lucky faint that them is capitalised on, a lucky mishap. Sometimes it's a combination. For William of Malmesbury, who's right much later, but he has his own particular spin on the battle. He sees it as a tragedy for the English rather than a, a Norman triumph. So he has this sort of, the English are, are standing in its mounds of dead as they are heroically sacrificing themselves, but he says they are undone by the cunning of the Normans. And it's really unclear about whether you're meant to admire the cunning of the Normans or you're meant to say, oh, this is terrible. The English were so valiant and they were just undone by a smarter opponent. Because the way he talks about it, it's very ambiguous. Well, I think this is one of the things when people think about medieval warriors, and you mentioned it in the back, it's like basically meatheads in armor or something like that. Yeah. The <laughs> chivalric maniac stereotype. Right? Yeah. That you would never even want to pretend to be retreating because that would be so dishonorable. But no one thinks of it as dishonorable. They just think it's a great tactic. If you are pretending to surrender, that's no problem. <laughs> As long as you win it afterwards. <laughs> yeah, the tenor of it throughout the sources that I came across, and I was quite surprised by this when I started because I thought we were going to get more people saying, and it was a terribly dishonorable thing that they did, is generally either the criticism is usually on the person who gets tricked. You're supposed to expect this. Your opponent will attempt to do everything he can to deceive you. Again, Gerald of Wales has an account of a Norman baron who wanders off into the forests of Wales with a minstrel going before him, playing the harp of Mont Python, and the Welsh attack him and kill him because they jump out of the forest because they're waiting in wait. And this isn't Gerald using this as an example of how terrible the Welsh are. He says, this, look at this idiot. He should have listened to his advisors, the good men around him who were saying, don't do this. The Welsh are waiting for us. They will kill you. And he goes, no, 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 it's fine. Usually when there's a trick, it's almost invariably the person who gets tricked who is criticised for being imprudent, for lacking in sense, for lacking in intelligence. And the chroniclers will usually spin their favourites, their protagonists, their heroes, as displaying great prudence, great craft, great skill and sense. Because, of course, prudence is a Christian virtue. Christ says, be as innocent as doves and as wise as serpents. And the word wise in Latin is cunning. It's the same word that's used for military cunning. So there is this thought going out throughout both Christian and, of course, classical sources, because you have the Romans who have a whole book, Frontinus, this Roman author, writes this whole book, which is nothing but all these different ruses that I found in history. So the Romans are perfectly happy with it. And you can certainly interpret Christian morality to include this kind of sneaky behavior, this cleverness. The only thing that seems to be beyond the pale, the kind of thing that's always regarded as dishonest, is if you make a promise. Mm -hmm. You say to an opponent, we will not attack you on this time and this day. If we make truce at this time and this day, and then you break it, then that is almost always described as being beyond the pale. That is terribly dishonest and awful. Although you get hints occasionally about how people justify even that. Yeah, but people would because of course you know the ideal is everybody swears by their honor and their word and swears by God and on holy relics, and then the histories are dropping down with people who break their oaths for various reasons, and we do occasionally get some hints about what excuses they use. So 
Galbert of Bruges, Galbert of Bruges, who is in Bruges at the time of the assassination of Charles the Good of Flanders. He's killed by a bunch of his vassals who then hold themselves up in the tower in Bruges, the castle. And the rest of the vassals come and besiege the castle and want to punish them. But they've also got treasure in there inside the castle. So Galbert says that the besiegers are sending messages up to the castle saying, send out the Count's treasure, and if you send the money, we'll let you go. It will be fine. We'll do a deal. So the people inside are sending out the money, and then they're not being let go. And Galbert says, and he seems to be criticising the besiegers in this, but he says that their excuse was they broke their oath to their liege lord when they murdered him. So they have put themselves beyond the rules of the game. They put themselves beyond conventional morality. So an oath made to an oath breaker is not valid. They have proven themselves untrustworthy. So we're under no longer under any obligation to keep our word to them. And so they get all the money and then they still storm the castle and kill them. So those are quite rare. The chronicles, a lot of them are meant to be moralistic. You're meant to read them and learn good morals and about how the righteous triumph, the wicked are inevitably punished. So usually oath breakers are portrayed wholly negatively. But I think with those kind of stories, we see a little bit of a glimpse into how these people would actually justify to themselves, if not to everybody else, breaking even the most sacred and the most taboo conventions in their society. Yeah, I thought that was interesting how they sidestepped that a little bit being, well, these people are rebels or they're already oath breakers. So it doesn't count. (laughs) I think even at the time people would be like, that's a little suspect. Yeah. (laughs) Well, the place where I thought there would be the most censure or disapproval was the part about night raids and ambush like it just seems like Mm. that is kind of a cowardly thing to do lying in wait for somebody knowing that it happens a lot. I thought night raids and stuff under the umbrella of chivalry would be unfair or unsporting but it's just thought to be quite a good tactic and again if you fall for it that's your own fault yeah absolutely it's got good biblical precedents gideon gideon famously goes with the midianites and smashes the jars all his men have torches and they make themselves look like there's more of them so it's a very very sneaky attack and this is righteous and this is scripture you know he's a a great prophet and so you've got that precedent there and yeah generally it seems to be that again in the chronicles if someone gets attacked at night it's generally regarded as your own fault or say you were imprudent you didn't set watches you didn't look after them when the french government in uh, the french who have taken over flanders now we're going back to brood here in 1302 the french governor james of saint paul was resting on the 17th of May in Bruges. And some of the Flemish were out in revolt against him. This is the campaign that ends the Battle of Detroit. The Flemish at dawn burst into the city and go around murdering the French garrison, go around murdering all the Frenchmen. They go up and they say to them, say, and it's schilt, the Flemish word for shield. And the French can't pronounce it properly. They can't say it with a Flemish accent. So they go, someone can't say it, but ah, no, you're French. Die. And then they killed them. And then a chronicler, who's a Franciscan guy in Ghent, I believe, is writing a chronicle later of this. And he, he actually has this whole passage where he says, the French said this was treacherous, but he says, the blame should rather be laid upon their own men who, without due care and prudence, entered a town which was not well fortified. Though around and near, it was so many of their capital enemies, strong, well-armed, and almost desperate. So the annals, the annals of Ghent, which is this source. What I think the distinction he's making here is that to the French, this is murder and treachery and treason because the Flemish are supposed to be loyal subjects of the King of France. The Count of Flanders is no more at this time. And therefore they have attacked without cause, without reason. Whereas to the Flemish, These French are invaders, they are conquerors, they are their enemies, and they know that we're out here, that we're going to try and do this. So we have informed you, we have come at you with banners raised and said, we are at war. You get caught now by us attacking you by night. That's your own fault. You should have known (laughs) that we were coming. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and the French are saying, well, this is a little unfair because we told you you could leave if you wanted to, yeah. and you did, and then you came back and did this in the night. That just doesn't seem right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see how the French are absolutely, this is a terrible crime and it's murder and violence, but for the Flemish, it's, it's heroic. It's mm-hmm. heroic and cunning. If you wanted to do a parallel here, think about maybe how we think about the French resistance, uh, mm-hmm. or the Dutch resistance to German occupation during the Second World War. 
if you were writing to the Germans, these people are terrorists, they are communists, they are fifth columnists, they are disloyal traitors to the Reich these things whereas of course to the french and the dutch they're, they're great heroes yeah and they're going to attack by any means necessary means, yeah, absolutely any means and then people writing back to that period are like well you gotta expect that if you're an occupier so it's exactly the same yeah, as you're yeah. saying yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. then the germans wouldn't treat them as prisoners of war they treated them as criminals because to them they were criminals that's how they thought about it and we now and, and at the time we regard them as irregular combatants in the war they thought of themselves as fighting a war of liberation but they were treated as criminals. So this sort of double standard, if we want to call it that, is not a medieval thing. It's not just medieval hypocrisy. It's something that we, we have throughout modern history, ancient history, and medieval history. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And the ideas of what is fair and what is right, it all depends on who we are looking at. One of the other things I was thinking about when it comes to ambush or night raids and stuff like that is that people are saying, well, that's not fair because we weren't wearing our armor. <laughs> you know? yeah. But you can't sleep in it, really, and you can't ride in it very far. So it's like, this is a smart play, but at the same time, it's a very unfair play <laughs> depending yeah. on who you're asking, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. That was something that I found quite interesting was that a couple of passages, because it, it's not explicitly talked about a lot because it's just a fact of life, was that you see in, often in movies and things, these medieval knights riding across the countryside in full armour with towels, you know, that they're medieval knights. But there are references to ambushes where they say they weren't armed. And they're riding in an army, but they haven't got any armour on. And the, the Chanson de Roland, as you mentioned, it says that after the battle, they sleep in their armour because they're afraid of being attacked. In the morning, they get up after the battle, Charlemagne, take off their armour and go riding. So you don't travel wearing it. It's incredibly heavy, it's incredibly hot, it's inconvenient. You have people for this. You have people to carry it for you. That's why you have all these pack animals and servants and squires and things. So if you can attack someone who's not expecting it, they're not going to have all their equipment, so that's incredibly vulnerable. I mean, it doesn't take them as long as I think the movies will tell you to put their armor on. They could do it in about 10 minutes, but that's a long time. Yeah, and it, it, it's rather <laughs> difficult when somebody's like stabbing at you with a sword or something, or like arrows are just raining out of the trees, you know. It's a distinction that I think is kind of uniquely medieval because, of course, the armor is part of your fighting kit. You know, it's different to being attacked in the early modern period or the modern period where it's firearms and everybody's unarmored, you know. Yeah, well, I think it's a good point that you make that it's mentioned that they sleep in their armor because whenever someone sleeps in their armor, they mention it in the Chronicles because it's so unusual. You're not really yeah. going to do that. It's too difficult, uncomfortable. You're not going to get any sleep. And everyone knows you need your energy if you're going to yeah. fight the next day. Yeah, there's a definite distinction drawn in the Chronicles. It's a fulture of Chartres describes one of the armies of the early crusader states going into enemy territory and it says drawn up in ranks with banners flying and it's, it's almost as if you have two stages you have your your traveling state where you're in one set of gear and one formation and work in one way and then you get ready and you get formed up for the fight and you everybody's in their arm and everyone's in the correct positions and things so if you can attack and be in a position to attack somebody who is in travel mode and you're in battle mode that's a huge advantage and it seems to be like yeah again if you are caught like that, that's your fault. That's generally the, the description that is given. And this applies to also in when we go on the Crusades, you have the Muslims, of course, the, the local Muslims, the Turks, the, the Turkish armies. When Louis the Seventh is on crusade, on the second crusade, he and his men have no idea what to do about the Turks. They, they get massacred when they get attacked initially. So they have to get Templars who are with them to take control of the army. And they say, right, no, this is how you march against the Turks because they've got experience of this. Whereas the French just, <laughs> the French just seem to go herring off after them. They've never seen this before. They're like, <laughs> hey, get them. Because, and, and that's how they would fight a battle in Europe. You know, they charge each other and shout fight and then one side would give way whereas if you're up against the muslims the turkish archers will ride away from you shooting you with arrows and then when you stop they'll come back and so they get cut to bits because they're out of position and the templars have to set down and we have this in chronicles is the marching order the templars say is, is you do not chase them everybody <laughs> stays in position until we tell you to attack and this appears to be like a recurring thing because the next generation of Battle of Artsuf on the Third Crusade, Richard the Lionheart has a terrible time keeping his army together on the march. Saladin is sending wave after wave of horsemen to attack him. 
and the, the hospitals at the back are desperate to charge. And so we need to charge. He says, no, no, you wait until my plan. And he has to ride down and stop from charging. Yes. Well, it's a great tactic that these Muslims and Turks, Mamluks are using where they're just going in. And they mention it as being like flies. They just yeah. come in and it's going to just make the Franks crazy, <laughs> make them want yeah. to attack. And it works in their favor quite a lot, actually. Yeah, yeah. The itinerarium peregrinorum. English Chronicle of the Third Crusade describes them as a, a wearisome fly that you're sort of waving <laughs> away. And it's just, as soon as you finish waving at it, it comes back. And it's just this wonderfully evocative image of how annoying and how weird, how devastating to fight this kind of army. <laughs> now, as a last thing, there are a lot of people who are scholars that listen to the podcast too. So I wanted to mention you, may I compliment you on your appendix? <laughs> which, oh, thank is, you. <laughs> which is not a sentence you normally say, but <laughs> your appendix lists all the examples you could find of these different tactics. So I'm assuming that you're putting this together to help other people to follow this. So what was what was your idea behind putting this appendix together? It started off as just let's get an idea of how common these incidents are, because if there's only half a dozen of them in the entire course of the First Crusade, then I haven't got a book. But actually, there were loads, loads and loads and loads. And part of the thing was, I wanted to show how one of the, the arguments here is, is that deception in, it was a feature of medieval warfare, whether people thought it was morally justifiable or not. I wanted to show that it was considered to be ubiquitous, that no matter where you were fighting, who you were fighting, that people would be using these deceptions. So part of the plan of putting together the appendix is just to show the breadth and the scale of the deception you can go through by plates, by things. But also, yes, of course, to go and talk about every single one of these would have led to the book to the thickness of a Bible and would have been incredibly boring to read because it's, it's, you know, a lot of it's repetition and a lot of it's not very interesting to talk about. A lot of these are just like sense, especially the ambushes, it will just say, and such and such ambush, such and such, and that's it. And there's not much to say. So the the bulk of the text is what I think of as the more as representative examples, but also ones where there's something more to say about it. You can then go and say, well, here's some ambushes, here's some disguises, but here at the back in the appendix are all of these other ambushes and disguises. So you can see what these are representatives of, and you can go and check for yourself if you're interested. For example, the feigned flight is an argument about whether the, the Normans were capable of feigning flight and whether this was something that was just made up. So I've actually got a whole load of examples of non Hastings battles and ambushes and skirmishes and examples where people are feigning flight and it's the Muslims feigning flight and Franks feigning flight, and Greeks and Irish and Welsh and all these people. So you can. I don't think it's a tenable argument anymore to say, oh, this was an impossible manoeuvre, this was too difficult to do. There's enough evidence to think that at least the chroniclers thought it was something that happened a lot. I think you, can, you can't argue that it was considered impossible by medieval writers. And if, if somebody wants to train up 2,000 modern knights and try it, um, I'll stand <laughs> corrected, but I don't, I don't think as outside of, of that or a, or a TARDIS. Yeah, <laughs> make that argument anymore. Well, now you've thrown down the gauntlet. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I did want to mention that because I think it's going to be a really good resource for people who are trying to just have a look so that they can base their own jumping off point on that. So it's great. So thank you so much, James, for coming on to talk about deception. I mean, there's so much more we could talk about, but you know, we're kind of restricted to a, a reasonable amount of time for a podcast. No, no. But <laughs> yeah, thank you yes. so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's lovely. To find out more about James's work, you can follow him on Twitter at jtitterton88, or you can visit his page at leeds.academia.edu slash James Titterton. His book is Deception in Medieval Warfare, Trickery and Cunning in the Central Middle Ages. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey. Oh, well, uh, I think we'll keep a bit of a military theme because Ani will be including a piece called The Sack of Rome in 1527. It's something I wrote originally for medieval warfare. It was actually the toughest physically that I had to write just because it's such a sad and depressing tale. But I always thought it was important to talk about. So, yeah, if you want to read some sad stuff, uh, you'll have that on, on the site. So. All right. But some more interesting stuff. We have uh, Yov Tirosh doing deafness and non-speaking in medieval Iceland. 
Awesome. So, so that's a fascinating bit. And also Lucy Lemonnier, she's got a couple of pieces for me coming up. And one of them is about the common and not so common names in Southern France. Those she, ones are always good. Yeah, she has this low town Montpellier and she makes great use of its sources. So love the things that are coming up from her. So we've got that coming up this week. Sounds great. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you to all of Medievalist.net's patrons on Patreon.com for your support each month. Patrons can access all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, formerly known as Medieval Warfare, as well as a book club and exclusive maps by Tina Ross. Your patronage directly funds this podcast as well as Medievalist.net's other work, so thank you. To get in on all the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from deception to devotion, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabolski, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an amazing day. Yeah.